uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, so I'm a software engineer for Zynga, and we're actually up here on our work week, um, and I'm flying home tomorrow, so I was really glad I got a chance to kind of squeeze this event in. Uh, San Francisco, you guys are an awesome town. Like, I've been here a few times, but I'm just blown away um, by the response to an event like this. Like, I'm, I'm nobody, and you guys came out to hear me, so that's pretty awesome. Um, so, uh, I have been doing JavaScript development for a long time. As a matter of fact, I sort of self-describe myself um, as a JavaScript snob. So, there's a lot of people out there that feel like they want to be polyglots and into a whole bunch of different things, and I'm the opposite of that. Uh, I, I focus entirely on web stack technology and JavaScript, and I'm pretty much bored by anything else. So, uh, if, that's, if you hear that perspective in what I'm talking about tonight, uh, that's why. Um, I've written a couple of different open source projects that have gotten some traction. Uh, namely, one there's actually one that I believe, at least at one point, maybe still true, being used by FormSpring is LabJS. It's a uh, JavaScript dynamic loader. Um, if you're interested in that sort of world and want to ask me questions about that, please feel free. Um, so, uh, we'll jump in. Th this, this website, getify.me, that has all of my contact information except for my personal cell phone, but every other piece way that you could possibly get in contact with me, it's up there. So if you have any questions afterwards or even during, but I won't answer during, but if you have any questions, just feel free to grab one of those, your, your prefer, preferred contact um, off of that site. Um, so as I alluded to, HTML5 cookbook just came out back right the, like the day after Thanksgiving. It's already doing, um, we're pleased phenomenally well. And I encourage everybody, if, uh, if you have not gotten a good HTML5 book, um, just take a look at this one. It's available in ebook form. We've got discount codes. Uh, we put a lot of work into it. This talk actually came because doing the, uh, the JavaScript heavy lifting for this book, as uh, my co-author came to me and said, hey, I need somebody to do some JavaScript. And I said, sure, I'm, I'm into that. And uh, I said, I'll take over the JavaScript part. And we got some other co-authors for some of the like the more boring stuff like articles and sections and stuff like that that people don't care about. But um, so I did the JavaScript part, and, and one of the chapters in there is advanced JavaScript, where we really kind of dive into some of the more heavy lifting of the APIs. And so <clears throat> out of that came this talk. I decided to um, figure out a single demo that I could build from scratch that would weave all of these different APIs into one. Because what was frustrating me actually writing the book was we were using all these disjoint examples. So you had an example for history API and a, a totally different example for something like local storage. And it didn't seem coherent. And, and that's actually one of my regrets a little bit from, um, from the book is that, unfortunately, some of those examples are disjoint. But that's the reason for this talk is we're going to actually build, we're going to talk about the building of a single game. It's a multiplayer online game. It's, the server is not currently up right now, but at the end of the talk, I will put it up. And if you, those of you that have laptops, if you want to connect and play, we can have fun with that. Um, but we're going to talk through weaving several of these advanced APIs together into making a game. Um, this is going to be extremely JavaScript heavy and code heavy. Some of this code may be because of the lighting, maybe a little bit hard to read. I'll try to explain some code. Um, but they will have the code, uh, the, the slides up online, so you can refer to it later if you want to. So without any further ado, we'll jump right into the code. And um, we're not going to see any kind of semantic tags. This is all JavaScript. Uh, the code for today, I forgot to mention, the code for today will be available, uh, is available up on GitHub, all this stuff, both server side and client side. Um, this web address, you don't, the only part that you need is the part that's in bold and, and uppercase letters, 5vl.github.fi. Um, the other part's just gravy. But that will take you to the GitHub repo. And now let's jump into some code. So we're going to first talk about Canvas. So um, this particular project, um, I, I'm using Canvas. It's not in the traditional way that you might expect for Canvas. Is that a little easier for people to read? OK, great. Um, this particular project uh, is not the typical one drawing arcs and gradients and stuff like that. This I'm using some of the more um, in-depth features that don't get as much coverage, um, things like global composite operation and things like that. So um, what I'm using uh, it for is a couple of different things. In this particular case, this code, build preview grid, I call this function when you have uploaded an, oh, let me back up and explain what this game does so you have some context. This game is a multiplayer puzzle solving game. You upload an image, it slices it up into a bunch of different tiles, mixes them up, and then people collaboratively, you can see people dragging pieces around and you're trying to put pieces in the correct location as quickly as possible. Uh, so we have a preview grid when you are uploading an image and it's, a, it's an overlay on top of the image element and it simply shows you based upon the difficulty setting where that grid, where those slices are gonna be made. 
So rather than just simply draw some white or black lines on top of the image, what I realized is that people are going to upload light images, dark images. It's hard to figure out. It's hard to inspect that image and figure out what line color to draw. So I was trying to figure out a way that I could sort of superimpose the image of this grid on top of an image. And what I came up with was global composite operation in Canvas. So essentially what I do um, is I, to draw the grid, I'm, I'm using, uh, if you see li line 300, um, and also line 303. So I'm, I'm, instead of drawing lines, I'm going to draw rectangles that are one or another two pixels wide. So I'm essentially drawing lines but with rectangles. And the reason for that is I want to use them as a clip or as a clipping mask as it's referred to. That essentially means that I want to draw something onto a canvas but only in the place where the mask is and not anywhere else. So I'm going to draw the grid as a mask and then I'm going to draw something on top of that and it will only draw into those grid lines. What am I going to draw on top of it is the image itself, and I'm going to do that twice. The first time I'll lay it over, and then I set the global composite mode, which I think is in the next slide. I set the global composite mode here on line 327 to lighter, and then I do the exact same thing again. What I get is the effect, it's the exact same image data, but it's been lightened by half. And that's overlaid on top, and what we'll see, uh, here we go. We'd, so context draw image is how we draw an, from an image element into a canvas element. Right, we'll have a screenshot here in just a moment. I'll come back to this. So you can see here, when I have this image, I don't have actual lines. What I have is the effect of lines by lightening those pixels using the global composite operation. So let me go back, actually, to some code. Uh, there's a couple of other places that I'm using, uh, a couple of other ways that I'm using canvas. Um, one is to slice up those tiles. So I have one big image, and I can calculate. I use some you know, fancy math to calculate where, how I want to size things and how I want to slice up all those tiles. But how do I get that image data out? Well, there's a function to get image data out of a canvas element. So if I draw an image into the canvas element, and I can give it coordinates. So I'm simply going to loop through. I think that is. I'm going to loop through and use context.drawImage on line 259 and I'm going to grab only those slices one at a time. So I loop through one at a time and grab the data out of the canvas element and get it as a data URL. That way I effectively split one image up into 20, 30, 50 separate images. So again, can Canvas has these really helpful methods, and it's kind of funny. You find yourself sort of jockeying between an image element and a canvas and back and forth because the image element has width and height properties that you want to read about an image, and the canvas element allows you to grab the data and manipulate the data. So I find myself in this project kind of drawing it into an image element, back into a canvas, and so forth, kind of swapping that. But once you get the feeling for that, it's actually really powerful to manipulate image data. This is what it looks like once the uh, image has been sliced up. You see the tiles there. They're all mixed up. And then you drag those into the grid. OK, so the next API that we'll jump into is AppCache. And let me give you a giant caveat um, before we jump in and explain AppCache. I don't use AppCache, and I don't like AppCache. I think it's kind of a sucky API. Um, I think it's got a lot of problems before it uh, gets to the point where it's going to be useful. Uh, but I thought it was useful for us to actually learn what it does and what, what are the pros and cons. Uh, if any of you do mobile development, you've probably heard a lot about using AppCache. Uh, it's one of those buzzwords in mobile development. Um, it's probably useful in desktop development too, but certainly more so for so AppCache. So the theory behind AppCache is that the caching that we have in browsers is too volatile and too unreliable for the types of things that we want to do in these really complex web applications where we're shoving sometimes 80, 90, even 100 percent of the code down through the browser, through the wire to the browser. And we're relying on all that code and all of that code to be there to be available. And if even a single file is not available, the whole application is going to break. It's like getting a corrupted download of an app. So um, <coughs> AppCache says, well, we need to solve that problem. We need to create a more persistent and more reliable caching mechanism. And there's a couple of offshoots that happen in addition to um, app cache kind of giving us the ability to make sure we can rely on the cache. And one of those is uh, related to the online offline status. So um, you'll see down here at the bottom of this file, which we'll explain in a moment, there's a fallback section. Uh, it was brought up that perhaps this game could have sort of a fallback mode where if you're not online, you just fall back to single player mode. Sure. Um, in this case, I probably just would have an offline.html and say, hey, uh, you need to have a connection to, to play a multiplayer online game. But uh, in some cases, you may have fallback content, and you would, you would um, list what the browser should do. So in the offline case, the browser would use that instead of 
one of the other resources that you had provided. So this file is, uh, I, I named this file cache.manifest.txt. Um, you can name it whatever you want. And the important thing, actually, which you'll see later, is that it has a content type, very specific content type. But this file is what we create to tell the browser all of the resources that are actually really critical that we're going to download and make sure that the browser caches in this special app cache. And so we list them in the cache section. And then we have a network session, section starting there on line 17. You'll see that I just have that star there. Essentially, I'm saying every AJAX request that I make needs to be available. If you do not specify a location in an app cached application, if you don't specify an online location that you're going to make network requests to in this section, the browser actually won't let you connect. So this is a, one of those other offshoots. It's almost sort of a pseudo security thing that it will not let an offline application or even an online application connect to one of those network locations unless it's explicitly listed here. I took the lazy road and explicitly listed star so that I get everything. But um, that's another thing that you can use the network section for. But the main meat that we're dealing with here is the cache section. We're listing all the different things that we want to make sure. And you can see I have the absolute address for jQuery, and then I have my other HTML and JavaScript and CSS files. This tells the browser, create a special cache that's not subject to the normal rules of expiration that the caches are exp um, subject to. It's not subject even to clearing through the normal methods of clearing. A user actually has to take a special step in their browser. And in some browsers, you can't really like, clear it. It's not that easy. Um, but it says, make sure that there's this special app cache in place to hold all of this stuff. And so that sounds well, all well and fine. That sounds actually really good for us because um, we know that the browser will make sure that's available every time the user opens their page. The problem is, the reason I don't use app cache is it's actually really, really good at what it does. It persistently caches it so well that it's really hard to update resources. So let's say I have this list of resources and I change a line in my JavaScript file. Most of us are probably familiar with the shift reload paradigm where we shift reload or even clear our cache and we make sure that we get that new version of the JavaScript file. Not true with app cache. You can change those files all day long on the server. They're not going to get ever re-downloaded to the client. There's only one way to force the browser to revalidate those resources, and that's to change the manifest file. Well, what if we don't want to change the manifest file because we're not adding files, we're just changing the contents of files. So it came along on, on line two, the kind of the best practice, if you will, is to put a comment in there and change the comment. Because if you change the comment in that file, that's enough to let the browser know, hey, I should get the new contents of the file and therefore go and revalidate all those resources. So this would be something that you would hook up into your build step, for instance. You would write out this file and you'd write out a new version every time you built your application or something like that. That's unfortunately um, just a reality of the way app cache works and you have to force that. But there's e even yet a further complication, which is yet another reason why I don't like app cache that much. Um, the complication is this. Let's say that a user has your application open and you change a file and maybe you even publish out some sort of update and you tell people, hey, go ahead and refresh your page so that you can update it. I've changed the manifest file. The browser's going to download it. Everything's going to be cool. They refresh it and they still have the old version of the file. And you're like, what the hell? Why would they still have the old version of the file when I change the manifest file? The reason is this. The browser, in the loading of the page, it will see that there's a new manifest file and it, and it will do its due diligence to go and request all of those files in the background while the page is loading. But it says, well, I already have a good version of these files, so I'm going to go ahead and serve the page with the old version of the files and in the background load the new version of the files. So you actually end up having to refresh the page twice to get a new update to code. And I don't know about you that do development in web applications, but I don't like refreshing once. So I'm definitely not going to refresh twice. That's why I don't have app cache hooked up while I'm developing this application. Um, there are, uh, the reason why we're covering this, though, is that there are ways to get around this a little bit. They did give us a somewhat of a helpful API. But before we get to that, the way you hook up a manifest file, you see up on line two, the HTML tag, we set a manifest attribute. We give it a URL to our manifest. That's all you have to do. Now the browser is in this special app caching mode. Um, so I, don't, I do not have that in mind. If you go and do a view source, this will not be in mind yet, but that's how you would hook it up. It does give us a JavaScript API to help us get around this. And what it does is it allows in JavaScript for us to forcibly tell the browser, go check and see if there's a new manifest file. Instead of waiting for a refresh, we can actually do so with JavaScript. So what we can do is we can say, um, let's see, it's line. Line 52, cache.update. This tells the browser, 
to proactively go and check and see if there's a new version of the manifest file, and if so, start downloading those resources. As soon as it finishes downloading the new version of those resources, it will file the, uh, fire the event update ready, and it'll let us know that those updates are there and they're ready in memory. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm saying, I might hook this function up to run once every 30 minutes just to check to see if there are any updates into my application, something like a Gmail, for instance. I may have that thing running just on a 30 second or I mean a 30 minute cycle in the background for people that leave the application open for a long time. But I don't want to refresh the page without them knowing because they may be doing something and, and lose the work. So I just pop up a little confirm box that says, hey, there's an update available. Would you like me to be helpful and go ahead and refresh the page, yes or no? Um, if you instead had you know, an application button inside of your web app that was a refresh button that allowed a user to proactively do that, then you could um, do away with the confirm because they've already told you they want to refresh. Um, but this is the API that we get. We get one event, and we get this uh, cache.update, which forces this ends up giving us the behavior of getting a single refresh instead of having to wait for two refreshes. Uh, but it's still kind of awkward, still difficult to deal with. So my recommendation, use app cache once you're fully production ready for an application. Don't use it before. All right. We'll jump into local storage and session storage next. Uh, local storage and session storage are the exact same API. The only difference is, other than the name, the only difference is how long the browser maintains or persists this data. Session storage, unsurprisingly, maintains that data only for the session, and it defines that session in most cases based upon the lifetime of the tab that the application is running in. So as soon as you open up a new tab in a browser, that's a new session. As soon as you close a tab, that session dies. So you have, um, in the cookie world, when we did cookies, there were this concept of session-based cookies, um, browser session-based cookies that would die once the browser session died. Same concept, the, local s the, s the session storage will be cleared out, it won't be available once you have ended a tab session. That does mean, however, that somebody can't share between multiple tabs. So if they're logged in the same application across multiple tabs, those are different sessions and they're not gonna be able to share that. Local storage, on the other hand, is fully persistent storage. Both these APIs give you five megabytes. Local storage um, will stick around forever. So you actually probably want to do some sort of rudimentary expiration mechanism or at least carefully manage your data so that you're not just filling up somebody's data. So for instance, if you had an app that they used and, and every couple months you changed your scheme and wrote out different key names, if you don't clean up after yourself, you're going to end up just leaving a bunch of extra data in that person's uh, local storage unless they're diligent about cleaning that out. So be careful about that. Um, in this application, I'm using them for very simple tasks. For the session storage, I'm keeping track of the person's session that they've established with the game <coughs> server so that when they refresh the page, um, they don't have to re-log in. So that's basic. I'm keeping se track of session storage. That login session is lost if they close the tab or go to a different browser, but at least across refreshes, it will keep them connected or be able to re-establish the socket connection right away. Local storage I'm using for a very simple task to maintain the user's name and email address in the login form so that they don't have to retype it. So as soon as you've typed that in, it stores that in local storage and it'll keep that across sessions even though you, so when you come back and it says you have to log in, you don't have to retype in that data. So again, very basic usages. One caveat on local storage and session storage API and this is kind of the performance side of things because I'm also a performance geek. Um, these are synchronous APIs. And uh, for, for those of you that don't understand b the, much of the difference between synchronous and asynchronous, uh, from a browser vendor perspective, I used to work for Mozilla before I worked at Zynga, from a browser vendor perspective, a synchronous API is the worst possible performance that we can get. So the browser vendors all sort of cringed when the people that designed these things came up with synchronous APIs. It's nice and easy for us because we just call get item and it immediately returns us the item. It's lots and lots of pain for the browser vendors because they, sometimes many of these browsers like Chrome, for instance, they have multiple processes and your storage may not actually be in that process. It may be inter-process and creating synchronous communication across those things is horribly inefficient. So the moral of the story is do not use local storage and session storage in performance sensitive code. For instance, inside of a loop where you're throwing a whole bunch of data into something because that will lag very quickly. Um, but you can, like, you would never want to use that in something like a, in an animation, you know, I don't know why you would do it, but you'd never want to read or write from, a, from local storage or session storage when you're doing something time sensitive like animation. But in this case, we're just doing a single read and write per page refresh, so it's not a big deal. Uh, just keep that in mind. The synchronous API makes it easier for developers to deal with. We don't have to have callback soup, but it has the negatives that unfortunately we have 
um, this performance implication to browsers. Um, I think I've already covered this, but we have local storage.set item to set in some user info. We have get item to get it out and remove item to delete it. It's pretty straightforward. It's going to be the same thing. Uh, this is what it looks like for, you know, it's remembered that my name and email address is there in the form for me. It tells me that I need to log in. Okay, so next we're going to jump into the history API. Um, history API means that we have taken several big problems that we had with history management in the browser and we fix them across a couple of different APIs in the application. And by fix them, I mean we found all these problems that we've been dealing with for years, like the hash bang ridiculousness, and actually fixed it so that we could do the things we need to do in an application. So in a, in a basic sense, the biggest problem that applications have faced is that we got into the Ajax era where we realized we don't want to create a new page refresh every time there's new page content that's being asked for. But when we did that, when we said, hey, we've got this, uh, you know, this nice ability to Ajax some data from the server and we don't have to page refresh, but we do want the user to see the update in the address bar. We do want for them to have backward forward capability because that's useful. And we do want to, for them to be able to bookmark a URL, save that URL and come back to it later. And we lose that when we have this whole Ajax concept. So we got this whole idea of storing the state of a page in the hash of that URL because you can change the hash without causing a page refresh. And this worked okay, but it created lots of other bugs and lots of other problems. So HTML5 came along and said, let's fix these problems. Let's give the existing APIs the capability they need so that you're not having to do that kind of stuff anymore. So now, when I Ajax um, request some data on the page in this particular game, you click on a link to go to the login page, for instance. The address bar updates to say login.html. But we didn't do a page refresh to login.html. We simply went and requested that over Ajax using a normal jQuery Ajax request, for instance. We got that content, we replaced the content in the page, and then I told the browser to update the address bar. And that's very simple to do. This Ajax link function is how I hijack all those links, and you see the bottom line is on, li on line 30, I call go to page, if this is a link I want to hijack. So go to page, we have, um, here I'm asking if it's already in sort of in my in-page cache, so I don't have to keep refreshing it. I, I kind of manage an in-page in cache. If it's already there, I use it. Otherwise, I go ahead and request it using an Ajax request. Post injection is the function that's going to call our history API. So we'll look at post injection. Oh, th before we do that, here's what this looks like. You can see that I've gone to the login page, and I have an entry in my history, so I can click back and go back to the home page from the login page. I have an entry in the history. I have the address bar updated. I've uh, Blurred out that address because I don't want you guys playing the game yet. I don't want you to pay attention to my talk, but we'll get to the game later. <laughs> um, but it has the entry in that history, and it would work for both backward and forward history entry just like we want. Here's post injection. So post injection says, okay, we have, we have already updated our content. Now we just need to take care of the history management. And you'll see on line 82 and line 85 is where it does. uses either replace state or push state. A replace state means what it says. Whatever the current address entry in the browser, replace it with this new thing that I want. Here's the address URL. That's the third parameter to the call. Uh, update the address bar and update the entry, um, the existing entry to what I'm asking you is this new state. So I use replace state when I am making the login page what is called an interstitial. When you navigate to the login page, you can click backward and forward. As soon as you have logged in, now I don't want login.html to be part of your backward forward history because there's no reason for you to ever go back to that page. So as soon as you're finished logging in, I replace the next page refresh, I replace uh, on top of login.html and you end up being able to go directly from the home page to a logged in page. So that's what replace state is and push state unsurprisingly adds history state to it. So history.push state and history.replace state are actually calls to an API called history.js. This is a shim for browsers that don't have these new functions. They implement it and they fake it in some, in some other ways for you. So I highly recommend using history.js. Makes it totally stupid simple to use. And, um, and they, they give you, but these are underlying functions that you'd be able to call in the native API if you felt so. Again, here's what it looks like after I've already logged in. I only have two entries from WePuzzle into the, in the forward back because I've replaced the login page with this page. The last thing that we need to do to deal with history API 
is that we need to be able to respond when that, when that URL changes outside of the control of our code. What we just saw in the previous slides was when we are specifically having the user, we're responding to a user clicking something and navigating them to a page and we want to update it. But what happens if the user clicks the backward or forward button or the user pastes in a URL from a bookmark or something like that? We want to respond to that as well. We simply listen for the event. You can see on line 38, we listen for the event state change and then we go ahead and do the underlying work. So whichever one comes first, the underlying page refresh happens and then we update the history or the history changes and we update the page. Either way, we can take care of it. And these are additions that have been added onto native HTML5 history handling. And again, history.js, a very nice API to manage it. Next, one of my most uh, favorite topics that we deal with, WebSockets. How many of you are familiar with what WebSockets means? OK, good, a fair, fair amount of you. I'd say like 60% of you, great. So uh, I use a, a library, sort of a shim, just like history.js. I use a library called socket.io. It implements sockets both on the server as well as in the browser. In the browser, it has several different fallbacks if the browser doesn't support sockets. So it uses like an invisible flash socket and several other um, workarounds for sockets, long pole Ajax and things like that. And on the server, it implements the latest version of the socket protocol, so it takes care of all the server things. It's implemented either in Node.js, they've got ports to Python and Java and C++ and other things like that. So whatever your backend is, there's a good chance you can probably get a port of Socket.io, but it gives you the exact same API for listening and s subscribing to events and emitting events. That's all this is, is a two-way communication between your browser and your server to send events back and forth. Instead of a one-way channel, we have a full duplex two-way channel. We listen to events and we send events, and they can be any events we want, custom name events. So you see here, I'm knitting a session uh, on line 825. Uh, I'm listening for the disconnect event on line 8. 18 or 819, whatever that is, that's the line where I'm connecting. It's very simple, and I, I start listening for events with socket.on, and then we see um, socket.emit on line 868. Socket.emit is how we send an event. So this is happening in the browser. This is how we listen for events from the server. You can see I just have you know, custom names for these events. There's nothing special going on. Um, and I can send JSON data back and forth between the server and the browser. It's fully asynchronous and, and, and very performant. It's, it's actually surprisingly performant. If you play this game on a good you know, internet connection, you'll see it's unbelievable to think that literally thousands of messages a second are traveling back and forth between the server and the browser, and you don't see any lag at all. So, um, so here I'm emitting a, a, a socket a event to say I want to ask the server to validate my session, and I'm going to listen for some responses like new session or whatever. Um, again, if, if when we do socket.on, that's adding an event listener. You're probably also familiar with removing event listeners, so you can clean up after yourselves, and it's socket.remove listener. So it's a very simple API. If you have ever done any kind of event-oriented programming in JavaScript, which most of you probably have, responding to click events, it works exactly the same way. You don't even have to think about it. It's just very simple. This is on the server, and you'll notice that this code looks a lot the same. Of course, I'm using JavaScript and Node.js, which is nice. But this code, the API looks a lot the same. So I have socket.on, socket.emit, just like I have in my JavaScript code. This actually allows you, if you had the opportunity and you, know, and you could work the code the right way, you literally could use the same code in both places. Again, some more socket.ion. I've got uh, line 362, for instance. There's some fancy stuff that's supported only on the server. I'm listening to a channel called site. So I have two different channels of my socket connections. Cha uh, actually, that's a namespace called site. And then .in game and game ID on that line is a channel. So that's a way to partition out your messages. So if you broadcast a message, it doesn't have to go to everybody. It can go only to the people in a particular game or only the people in a game in a particular state. So it gives you the flexibility to partition out your messages from the server. Yeah, is there a question? Uh huh. So the of is for namespacing, and in is for channeling. Um, and there's not really, for the for the purposes of most discussions, not really that big of a difference. In my particular case, I have two main socket connections that each browser makes. One is for the site management, like your login session and all that stuff. And another one is when you are in a game, it's managing all the communication, the dragging of pieces and all that stuff. So I established two socket connections and I have them namespaced as slash site and slash www. And then I have channels for each one of my games so I can further partition the data. Okay, on to web workers. 
Um, I have to admit that before I got into this project, I felt like Web Workers was probably one of the most like academic APIs. Yeah, it sounds cool on paper, but will I ever find a real use for something like Web Workers? And the truth is that it's actually really useful and really cool. And the nice part is it looks a whole lot like working with Web Sockets. You are remoting a message to another thread just like you're remoting a message to a server from the browser. It looks the same way. You're sending messages back and forth asynchronously. Um, so again, no mental context shift at all. It, slightly different API, but no mental context shift at all. It's the same idea. Here we create a game worker on line 294. We give it a URL for a separate JavaScript file. It will load up that separate JavaScript file into a separate thread of execution. Why is this important? Well, some of you may be aware, and this is another one of those performance things, some of you may be aware that um, when you have a browser that has, has rendered a, a page and you make some change on the page, like you move an element or change a style or CSS, browser has to do re-rendering of that page. It has to recalculate the position, recalculate all the rendering, and repaint that page. All of that stuff happens on your main browser session, or your main browser thread. Um, JavaScript shares that same thread, which means if you have a long-running algorithm, you're going to cause slowdowns of that repaint. Even things like garbage collection inside of your main JavaScript can slow down the repaint. So well, you've probably been to pages and you've seen uh, what should be a nice smooth animation, but it starts becoming laggy and jaggy because of that exact problem that you're sharing this thread and it simply can't do enough, especially in low power mobile devices. It just simply can't do enough. Well, we have the solution. We can run a long running JavaScript or an intensive processing JavaScript in an entirely different thread and it will not affect the rendering thread of the browser at all. So we can get back to that more ideal place where the browser is able to repaint itself in a much smoother fashion and we can have long running or more complex JavaScript happening elsewhere. So for the purposes of my game, what I wanted was to have this other sandbox where code was harder for people to kind of muck around with because it really is a fully closed off thing. They can't change the prototypes in there and, and muck with your code inside of a web worker like you can um, in the browser DOM. And also, it has the, the, the performance nicety that any, any intensity of communication between the browser and server, all the messages of updating pieces and stuff, I can buffer all of that stuff inside of the web worker and send those messages over to the browser rendering thread and hopefully have a lot less slowdown in the browser thread. So for a real-time game, web workers actually have a lot of really cool potential. So um, game worker is what I create my game worker. I have on message that listens for messages from the worker. And then um, down here, I want to send a message, so I do gameworker.post message. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, I think we're almost done with the web worker stuff. I wanted to show you this is what it looks like inside of that www.js. This is what a web worker code lo looks like. We have only a couple of things that look different from normal JavaScript. We have an import scripts function. That's how we can synchronously import other scripts. So here you can see I'm loading up the socket.io library inside of, um, inside of our web worker, and then I, you know, normal stuff, variable declarations and function declarations. The only difference here is if I want to listen for messages from the server, I do self.onMessage to listen for message, not from the server, from the browser thread, and then I can do self.emit to send messages back. Pretty straightforward. It looks the same in both places. Last thing I wanted to show um, was that we have, um, so some browsers do not have web workers, and there's not a really a way to shim the missing web worker so that you get full parallel threads. You can't create threads where the browser doesn't let you create threads. But you can create an API that looks exactly the same, and you can take advantage of the fact that you don't have to have totally different code. So that's what I did here is I wrote a simple little shim. It gives me the post message and on message behavior for a browser that doesn't have a web worker. Still gonna, my code's going to function the same, just going to be slightly less performant because we're not taking advantage of having that separate thread. There are better shims than the one that I wrote in this project that are much more full and complete. I just wrote a very, very simple stripped down one um, for, for managing the code. But this is the shim for dealing with web workers. I would encourage you to search on GitHub. You'll find better ones than the one I wrote. Last API that we're going to talk about is local file access. This is actually one of the more exciting ones as well. Um, for years and years, we had the ability in an input type of you know, a file selector, we could select a file reference and we could attach it to a form and upload it on the form. But we, in the JavaScript world, had absolutely no control or readability into the data that was getting sent. So we'd have to do these stupid things like upload a file to the server and then tell the server you know, to, to send it right back down to the browser or things like that. So 
Um, this is a terrible problem that we just dealt with for years and years, and it's mostly because of the security concerns that they had. And they didn't deal with that security in a smart way, so they just said simply don't give them any access at all to somebody's local file system. Thankfully, HTML5 came along and said, no, not any longer. We've got to give them access to the file contents. You do still have to have a user-initiated action. So it does still have the same security protections that it otherwise would. The user has to pop open a file input box, or they literally have to drag a file from their desktop onto the browser to initiate a file selection <coughs> event in the browser. But once a file selection event has been initiated by a user, then your JavaScript is capable of grabbing a reference to that file and reading its contents and reading its properties. So what we use this for, obviously, is when you're uploading an image in this game, it shows you the image right away, and it does that overlay of the grid and stuff like that. Nothing has been sent to the server at that point. We're manipulating that image using Canvas. That way I don't have to actually go. You can do that image manipulation on the server, but I didn't want to go to the trouble to do that. If I've got the browser and I've got Canvas and all that, let's do it all inside of the browser, manage all that data, and then once we're fully done processing it, we'll send it to the server. So here we see uh, I've got a, a reference to my file selector, and I'm listening for the change event. As soon as the change event fires, I have an array of files that were selected. In this case, I'm only going to pay attention to the first file. You can't select multiple files, but theoretically, you could have an array of files to process. Uh, so I grab the first file, and I immediately start doing something cool. I look at its image type, or I mean, I look at its file type, its MIME type. And I make sure that it's an image, that it has the word image in its MIME type so that you're not uploading you know, malicious Word document macros or something like that. So I check to make sure it's got the right type. And then uh, on line uh, 717, I check to make sure that it's got the right file size so it's not too big. I don't want you to you know, upload a 16 megabyte file and crash my server or something. So I'm checking for max file size. So I'm, I'm getting access to these properties right away on this file reference that I never had access to before. And this is pretty awesome. Then on line 721, I call read file. Um, that's another function that I wrote, which we'll see here in just a moment. But I'm essentially saying at this point, I've checked that the file is the right type. I've checked that it's the right size. Let's go ahead and read its local file contents. And we're going to paint that directly into an image element and then use our canvas to mess around with it. So read file, very straightforwardly. There on line 477 at the top, we create a new API called File Reader. It's a nice little API. We get the opportunity to provide it a file reference and ask it to read it. It's an asynchronous thing, obviously, but we ask it to read that file. We, listen, we have an onload listener that listens for when that finishes. And once we get the contents from it, then I'm going to call render preview. So it's very straightforward. I simply say read, and then on line 493, read as data URL. There's read as binary type or blob or something like that. There's a couple of different reads. In this case, I would like to have a data URL because I can stuff, stuff that right into the source attribute of an image element. So read as a data URL. This is what it looks like. I click the choose file. It pops up the file open box and goes for it. So that's uh, the APIs that we're going to look at tonight. This server, um, I'm going to go ahead and switch over and start up the game server. If any of you have managed to figure out how to get access to the game, in just a moment, hpi.getf.fi um, is where that'll take you to the game. We'll be able to play it. So we'll see if we have any luck in actually showing off live demo here. All right, so I'm connected to this game. I'm going to go and click login. We've already seen this before. Now I'm connected onto the page. All that's happening without refreshing the page at all. Make your own puzzle. Um, for those of you who are trying this out, maybe you don't have images on your computer. I've got uh, a set of sample images that you can just grab and try to play with. Um, to upload. I've already checked those out. But we'll just grab one of these files. Let's see. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. Some of you guys may know Ryan Dahl. We've got an image of him. So that's not really refreshing very well. Let me refresh this. Let's pick a different one and see if it work. renders it better. Okay. We've got a crowd here. I've got a difficulty selector, so it's going to... It's not really drawing these lines very well. Let me close this browser and Chrome's sometimes funny about getting into weird memory states. <coughs> oh, look, it remembered my login information. That's cool. Used. Well, there we go. That's a little bit better. So you see it's drawing those grid lines on top of Ryan. If I select it, 
as you know medium difficulty it's going to draw smaller tiles and hard difficulty let's go ahead and try one of these hard ones we'll create the puzzle so it's already sliced all that image side sent all that image data up to the server created files and reloaded it. and that was pretty darn quick so now we have all these tile images and let's see if I can figure out like uh, let's drag this to here maybe yep I got that one correct so if any of you guys can actually yep see so you can see that other people are playing the game and you can see where people are dragging images around so this can actually get kind of fun so all that's happening right here my browsers connected on a socket your browsers connected on a socket and every time you move I'm sending those XY coordinates down to the server and then broadcasting that as a, to all connected that's how we're getting hundreds thousands of these messages getting sent out and you're able to see that without too much lag we're seeing uh, the dragging of all those images so this you can see how that can get kind of fun in terms of your collaborative gameplay and so forth and see we see the uh, Liz is doing really well, scoring lots of points already. So we can take a look and see if anybody's creating. We can create some more puzzles here for people to play with. Let's try. Uh, let's try creepy clown. Create that one. Let's try another one. Bird is actually a really pretty picture just stole all of these off of Google Images, so I apologize to the author of these images, but I'm not making money off of it, so. So there you go. I am hugely grateful for the opportunity to come and do this, and I hope that what you get out of this more than anything is not my specific code, but I hope you're inspired that there's a lot of really cool stuff, and it is actually practical to weave this stuff into something useful in real world. And it's not just a game. There's ways to weave these APIs together and make real and useful stuff. This is not just the stuff of academics, it's not just the stuff of books, although please go buy my book. Um, <laughs> but take the stuff from that book and go build cool stuff like this. And I hope you're inspired by that, and thanks for the opportunity.